This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Better than it looks, the economy added fewer jobs than anticipated last month, but the market looks past the headline and the Dow climbs by triple digits. Keep on trucking. The trucking industry says there's more freight than it knows what to do with. One problem, though, not enough drivers, and that could create waves through the economy. And chemical attraction. Meet two men whose quest is to make chemicals better, safer, and cheaper. All that and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Friday, August the 3rd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is the first Friday of the month, and that generally means the monthly employment report is out, and that certainly was the case today. The headline tells you it was a miss, that the economy created fewer jobs than expected in July. That would be true. The economy added 157,000 jobs last month, more than 30,000 off the mark. Wage growth? Not all that great. But unemployment broke back below 4%, and it turns out May and June were actually even stronger. So was the report really all that weak? Steve Leisman has some answers. It was a weaker than expected July jobs report that was actually stronger than it looked. The government reported that 157,000 jobs were created in July, down from 248,000 in June, and below the expectations from Wall Street. But both the May and June reports were revised up by a strong 59,000 jobs. So the three-month average growth, which limits a lot of the noise in month to month, is a very strong 224,000. What's more, the unemployment rate fell to a low 3.9 percent. Overall, I think what we're looking at here is still a very strong job market, very rapid employment growth, far above the underlying trend that's needed to stabilize the unemployment rate, which is in the low 100s. Um, but wage pressure is still fairly limited. There was strong job growth in several sectors, including leisure and hospitality, manufacturing, and temporary help. Construction, retail was weak because layoffs at the bankrupt Toys R Us brought it down by maybe as much as 32,000. There's also a big one-month decline in education employment that economists said could be from problems adjusting data for normal summertime layoffs. The one standout weakness in the report Wages were up just 2.7% year over year, about the same as it's been, but it's all a muted gain given the low unemployment rate and robust job market. The bottom line is that workers have lost the negotiating power that they once had relative to the owners of capital, relative to these senior managers, and it shows in the distribution of wages. There also is this sort of change in the structure of the job market that we're seeing out there to more lower wage jobs that is not helping as well. Most forecasters expect wages to climb eventually as the job market tightens further. But for now, as Swank put it, everyone can get a job, but no one can get a raise. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Let's talk about that. Joe Davis is joining us tonight to analyze more about the jobs data. He's global chief economist at Vanguard. Thanks for joining us tonight, Joe. Uh, thanks for having me. How much tighter does this labor market get, do you think? Well, I, I still think we can get uh, tighter still. Um, you know, I think with the unemployment rate ticking down uh, below 4 percent, I would not be surprised that a year from now, um, if conditions hold uh, globally, that we could be potentially below 3 percent. Now, that would sound um, pretty sensational, but given, you know, the slow uh, increases we're seeing in labor force and continued robust demand from employers, it would not shock me that a year, 18 months from now, we would be below 3 percent on the unemployment rate. Well, I don't want to throw cold water on it at all, but underemployment yeah. was kind of an issue in this particular yep. report. Could yep. you address that? Yep. Well, I think that still will remain uh, elevated, so I mean, it's something that we've seen this sort of ratio of underemployment to, to the actual official unemployment rate ever since the global financial crisis 10 years ago. I think part of that reflects structural mismatches uh, in the labor force, meaning mm -hmm. uh, there's a critical demand for certain high-skilled industries or education levels, which currently we're not able, or at least employers are not able to find those workers, at least immediately. And so I think that is that ratio is going to, or that, that gap is going to remain elevated for some time. Now, that, can, that means that we can still say wage pressures, but I think that is keeping a little bit of a lid down uh, on, on some of these measures. Speaking of wage pressures, as Steve Leesman pointed out, we're just not seeing it in the aggregate. I mean, I, back when I was in school, we were always taught that 5% <laughs> was full employment and that that's when you start to see wage pressures. We're not seeing it right now. So when do you think we will at some point? Well, our best estimate is roughly 3.5% on the unemployment 
on, on the unemployment rate, which we're not there yet, we're, we're, we're slightly above that, uh, if, that should we drop below 3.5%, we'll start to see more meaningful wage pressures. I mean, there is, there is a, at some point, we will need to see higher wage pressures. It is obviously very uh, difficult to, to precisely estimate what so-called full employment is, but right. I think it is lower than in periods in the past. So 3.5%, which would mean maybe towards the end of the year we could see uh, greater wage pressures. What does that do to overall economic growth? You know, the, the estimates are kind of mm -hmm. all over the board on does it get much yep. better than this or do we have a little bit of a deceleration? Well, I, th I think the job numbers, we're going to see some deceleration. If there's any truth at all, and we believe there is, uh, to just you know, some sort of more muted labor supply conditions. In other words, the, the number of, of, of worker or potential workers on the side, there are some demographic constraints in the labor market. I mean, you mentioned trucking at the onset of the, of the program. That's right. just mm -hmm. one of a number of industries uh, running into supply constraints. I, I think the good news if, is if we continue to see modest upward trajectory in wages, that ensures a longer recovery um, and, a, and a, you know, a longer recovery uh, this cycle. I mean, some are talking about potential elevated risks of recession in 2020, but I think if we could see higher wages, some are associating that with higher interest rates. Right. I would also say, however, that would ensure perhaps more resilient consumer spending going forward. Joe Davis with Vanguard again. Thanks for joining us tonight, Joe. Uh, thank you for having me. It's China's turn. China is now threatening more tariffs on U.S. goods, just a couple of days after President Trump said he is considering upping the tariff amount that could hit Chinese-made goods. Kayla Taoshi reports. China is targeting more than 5,000 U.S. products with tariffs ranging from 5 to 25 percent. In retaliation for President Trump signaling he may more than double the tariff level forthcoming on $200 billion in Chinese imports. Some of the notable items in China's sites, 25 percent tariffs on aspartame, communion wafers, tires and textiles, and 20 percent tariffs on crayons, pencils and pens, golf clubs and contact lenses. In all, the items comprise roughly $60 billion in U.S. goods, a smaller number than the U.S. is targeting of China's as China imports less in U.S. goods than vice versa. Chief White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow acknowledges the U.S. and China are not engaged in trade talks. I have been involved in a lot of those U.S.-China talks, but not recently because there hadn't been any talks recently. I don't know what they're doing. But the White House says it's open to further discussions. Talks have stalled, but in recent days I can report there has been some communication for the first time in a good while. In the meantime, U.S. business groups are calling for a de-escalation of the trade war, but that doesn't appear to be in the cards. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche in Washington. And now here's another group concerned about trade escalation. That would be the apple industry. Apple farmers say that the triple threat of tariffs from Mexico, China, and India will cause serious damage and take a bite out of their business. Seema Modi is in Walden, New York for us tonight. Chris Brothers Apple Orchard here in Walden, New York, harvested 20 million pounds of apples last year and have been gradually increasing the amount of apples they produce, partially thanks to growing demand from overseas. But the onset of tariffs has put a number of apple orchards at risk. If market pricing falls below a certain point, we just can't make a profit. The margins are already pretty thin to begin with razor thin in some situations and if that pricing falls a little bit we could be looking at an un unprofitable situation and if we're looking at an unprofitable situation we stop planting we stop investing we stop buying equipment we stop hiring good wage jobs we stop and you know and we'll suffer and if it goes on long enough we'll eventually go out of business if fewer apples are going overseas farmers are worried the domestic competition between producers will intensify Another farmer in Hudson Valley says the ongoing trade dispute and confusion over whether tariffs will depress the price of apples has made it hard to plan and predict how much demand they'll see in the future. It's difficult in the apple industry is that when we planted these trees, many of them were planted seven or eight years ago and they're just getting into full production. Those decisions were made a long time ago and you can't quickly uh, pivot and uh, rip something out. The U.S. exported roughly $890 million worth of apples from August 2017 to May of 2018, up about 20 percent during the same period last year. And it continues to be a key export for top-producing states like Washington, New York, and Pennsylvania, plus 
a source of jobs. The U.S. apple industry is dependent on our exports. We export one out of three apples, and that's allows, allowed us to each year generate $15 billion in economic activity, create 71,000 jobs, and contribute a billion dollars to the U.S. positive balance of trade. So exports are super important, and the tariffs uh, are very concerning, and we would like to see these disputes get settled quickly and amicably. With the apple picking season kicking off next week, farmers in the Hudson Valley are under pressure to sell as many apples as they can. For Nightly Business Support, Seema Modi, Walden, New York. On Wall Street, stocks closed out the week with solid gains, led higher by Apple and IBM. The market also shrugged off the China trade threat and that soft jobs headline number. The Dow rose 136 points to 25,462. The Nasdaq climbed 9 and the S&P 500 added 13. For the week, the Nasdaq gained the most, up just about 1 percent. And today's triple-digit move saved the week for the Dow, which barely broke into the black. And when you hear that Apple is now worth a trillion dollars or that a share of Amazon is fast approaching $2,000, you probably think, boy, these are high-priced stocks. And you would be right. Remember, though, value may be in the eye of the beholder, but the fact is that the average price of a stock in the S&P 500 is at a record right now. Bob Pisani explains. Investors were all abuzz when Apple hit $1 trillion in market value, but what traders really want to see is higher volumes, and sky-high valuations are not helping in that department. Trading volumes have been stagnant for years, but stock prices keep going up. You know the average S&P 500 stock is now $115. That's the highest in history. Five years ago, it was only $78. And it's not just Amazon, by the way, which is approaching $2,000 a share. That's a level that would have been thought absurd five years ago. In 1998, just to give you an example, no stocks were over $250 in the S&P. Today, there's 30. The first $1,000 stock appeared in 2013. Now there's four in the S&P. You can thank the relentless rise of the stock market, which is up 50% in the last five years. But the most important thing is the refusal of companies to split their stocks. Why? Companies used to split their stock because they felt a lower price would make it more appealing to average mom and pop investors. But in the last decade, we've seen that institutional investors have become more dominant in the market, and generally they don't care that much about the actual price. They buy by dollar amount, not stock price. That's why stock splits are now so few and far between. In 1999, nearly 20% of the S&P 500 split their stock. It was so common that Standard & Poor's once had a business that would beep you when a company announced the stock split. Only three companies in the S&P have split their stock so far this year. That's amazing. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Up next, Help Wanted. I'm Kate Rogers in Salt Lake City, Utah, and tonight on Nightly Business Report, we're going to tell you how a massive labor shortage in the trucking industry is impacting nearly every segment of the economy. So as today's jobs report showed, the national unemployment rate is back under 4 percent. But one area that could use more workers is the trucking industry. With about 70 percent of freight in the country moved by trucks, the demand for drivers has never been greater. As you saw, Kate Rogers is in Salt Lake City with a closer look at that issue. The nation's truck driver shortage is so severe, it's caught the attention of the White House. And here representing the American Trucking Associations. And we're committing to 50,000 new opportunities wow. over the next five years. That's big stuff. Thank you, Dan. Thank, Thank you. you. And for Dan England, former president of the American Trucking Associations, the labor crunch isn't just an industry problem. It's personal, as he looks to find drivers for his family's fourth-generation trucking company. We have right now about uh, just a little under 6,500 drivers. And gosh, if we had 500 more right now, we'd be, uh, we'd be very grateful. Uh, we, we're interested in growing. The business is there. Uh, we just need the manpower or woman power to get it done. Experts say the industry could use an additional 51,000 long-haul freight drivers as the shortage's ripple effect impacts industries from retail to construction. 
There's more freight than ever, and last year, trucks hauled 70% of it across the country, accounting for $676 billion in revenues. Long hours, federal age restrictions, and congested roadways all make attracting new recruits a big challenge for trucking companies. Also, the driver population is aging and lacks diversity. Only about 6% of truck drivers are female, according to the ATA. That means drivers like John Shell Jenkins are a rarity. The 21-year-old just received her commercial driver's license. I told them, well, I can do it because just because it's a man job, I can do the same thing as a man. To attract workers in a tight market, companies are offering signing bonuses in the thousands, flexible schedules so that drivers can spend more time with family, new trucks, and loan repayments for training. While starting pay can begin around $40,000 annually, it's not uncommon to see multiple raises in a year. There is n there every reason to believe that the shortage is getting worse, not better. Right? And as that happens, and the demand for drivers is so strong, and the supply is limited, that means pay continues to go up. And while the industry grapples with the driver shortage, a brewing trade war also stands to negatively impact the sector. The ATA says NAFTA trade generates over $6.5 billion for the U.S. trucking companies alone, and directly employs 31,000 U.S. drivers. Any interruption in that, anything in the, the dynamic or the relationship between the, the countries that would affect that is going to, going to harm a lot of people, not, not just us. We'd like to see the status quo remain. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers in Salt Lake City. Kraft Heinz sees sales getting better, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The food company said profit and sales both fell last quarter, but results still beat street targets. The key, though, is the company says increased spending on marketing and new products should lead to stronger sales later this year. Separately, the New York Post says Kraft Heinz held preliminary talks with Campbell's Soup about acquiring the soup maker, but no offer is currently on the table. Kraft Heinz shares rose 8.5% to 64.48, while Campbell's Soup climbed 2.5% to 42.76. Take Two investors are taking more today after the video game publisher easily topped street targets after the bell Thursday. The company says the results were due to strong sales of Grand Theft Auto Online and NBA 2K18 game titles. Shares of Take Two rose 9% to 123.41. And shares of GoPro posted one of their best days in a year after the company posted better than expected results last night. GoPro also said that it sees sales for this quarter above estimates and it plans to launch three new cheaper cameras for the holidays this year. Shares were up 18 percent almost to seven dollars five cents a share. Discover Financial says its chief executive David Nelms is going to retire early next year. He'll be replaced by the company's current chief operating officer. Nelms has been CEO for 14 years now. Discover shares were up 2 percent today at 73.34. And Perry Ellis says it has received a new bid from Randa Accessories for $28.90 a share. That works out to $440 million, $444 million. That's up from Randa's earlier offer of $28, which was rejected. Now, this sweetened offer is another attempt by the privately held Randa to upend Perry Ellis's previously agreed upon deal with its largest shareholder. That deal is worth $437 million which works out to 27 and a half. What's interesting is today shares of Perry Ellis closed above all of those prices, up nearly 5% to $29.10. This week's Market Monitor has some high-quality growth names. He says they may give you some downside protection if economic growth slows. The last time he was on was November in 2017, and he picked Nike, which is up 43%, MasterCard up 36%, and Cognizant Technology Solutions is up 5%. He is Alan Bond, co-portfolio manager of the Jensen Quality Growth Fund, which is up 9% so far this year. Welcome back. Thank and you. Congratulations on those previous picks. Thanks. So you are giving us a little downside protection in case the economy turns a little bit south. Um, and they're interesting names. The first one, basically, we're going to go to Pfizer. And it's, it's a global play as well. Sure. So Pfizer is a global biopharmaceutical company with a wide-ranging drug portfolio. And we, we think that's a real key distinction for Pfizer. We think it limits their exposure and their risk to any one specific drug. 
And as we look at the, drug, the company's drug pipeline, we think it's a bit underappreciated, and we expect uh, revenue for Pfizer to accelerate as some of those drugs in the pipeline are converted to sales over the next few years. Then there's Amphenel, which is an interesting play. You know, you're, it, we're all going to fiber optics, and we've got cables and everything. This does all of that, doesn't it? Right. So, you know, Amphenol is a bit of an under-the-radar company, but they're a real key part of the supply chain for electronic manufacturers around the world. They make electronic components that go into mobile devices, into automotive electronics, into aircraft electronics. And we really think that positions them very well for the trend we're seeing in which electronics are really proliferating across the economy and across the globe. Mm -hmm. And next we go to uh, your final pick, which is 3M. Also a global play, but you also point out the dividend. It's paid a dividend for more than 100 years. It's raised the dividend payment for 60 consecutive years. So it's an income play as well. Yeah, so, you know, 3M is, is generally thought of as an industrial conglomerate. And we think that's a bit of a misnomer because they get a meaningful amount of business from consumer and healthcare end markets. And we think that really helps to dampen the, the earnings volatility we might otherwise see. A uh, company has some long-standing competitive advantages, in, including the strength of their brands and their manufacturing mm -hmm. and new product development expertise. And like you mentioned, 3M is an excellent producer of cash, and they have an incredible dividend history that we think uh, is, is very well positioned to continue. On that note, Alan, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. See you again thank soon. Thank you. Alan Bond with the Jensen Quality Growth Fund. Up next, how a pair of entrepreneurs are trying to prevent chemical disasters like this one drop at a time. There is currently a roughly a $4 billion global market for hydrogen peroxide, or H2O2. You might use it to clean cuts or to rinse your mouth or to bleach your hair, among other things that it's used for. Now, since the 1940s, it has been made with highly flammable petroleum-based solvents. But two Houston-based entrepreneurs got the bright idea to change the production process. Explosions at Arkema's chemical plant outside Houston in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey last summer put a noxious odor in the air. Sean Hunt and Gaurav Chakrabarty recognized it more than 30 miles away, hydrogen peroxide. We smelled it everywhere. Plant accidents are only too familiar in Houston, the world's biggest petrochemical manufacturing market. In 2016, an explosion at a different hydrogen peroxide plant there killed one worker. The petroleum-based solvent it's flammable. It's kind of like a bomb waiting to happen. Oh, okay. At their company, Solugen, Hunt and Chakrabarty, his friends call him G, use a new process to make hydrogen peroxide, the same stuff we use to clean cuts and countertops. G is also a doctor. He learned pancreatic cancer cells often contain high levels of hydrogen peroxide. Seven years of research led him to an enzyme, a protein, that aids in the production of hydrogen peroxide. He won't say how, but G figured out how to make an enzyme which does just that. A med school classmate introduced G to her husband who turned out to be Hunt, who was at MIT studying ways to make hydrogen peroxide with metals, like platinum. I'm like, that's unbelievable. So it's like, a, like you know, muscle milk, like a protein powder? Hunt had been taught that enzymes were weak and unreliable. Uh, the secret sauce to it all is in this fridge. But with machine learning, they've extended its lifespan from minutes, then days, to weeks. The ability to engineer those enzymes efficiently uh, and for low cost, low computing power was not possible five years ago. Most people from a petrochemical background, they have no idea that this has occurred. We are Solugen. They pitched the idea in 2016 and received immediate requests to buy their bio peroxide. So Hunt built a reactor using parts that he bought at a Home Depot. It's now our museum piece. Now, a bigger version of their mini mill, which mixes sugar, air, and water with the enzyme, took their hydrogen peroxide to market in the form of cleaning wipes. It's called Ode to Clean. It's the first cleaning wipe made 100% from plants. In just a few weeks, at four to five bucks a pack, they were on track to sell $4 million worth in a year. No wonder a major commercial wipe maker has already bought the brand. 
That deal may be announced this month, but G and Hunt have even bigger plans. Solugen also has an expensive setup to concentrate its peroxide. Taking out the water makes it cheaper to ship, but Chakrabarty and Hunt believe their mini mills can be built anywhere, decentralizing production. They're still fairly large, but they're nothing compared to an oil refinery. We would sell them the mini mill, we sell them the enzyme, they make their own hydrogen peroxide, and there is no shipping involved. 50 years ago, investors looking for a tip heard the word plastics. Now they might hear enzymes or plant sugars. I think we already are. I'll guarantee you in, in 50 years, we're going to be using plant sugars for many of our chemistries. If you can make chemicals from plants, plants are everywhere. You don't need to have these big centralized facilities. Isn't that fascinating? Now, entire communities use hydrogen peroxide to purify their water. G and Hunt see a day where those communities will make their own H2O2. And there may be a therapeutic application. Dr. Chakrabarty's work helped lead to a drug aimed at fighting pancreatic cancer that is in phase two testing right now. Wow. Amazing story. Before we go, here's a final look at the day on Wall Street. The Dow rose 136 points to 25,462. NASDAQ climbed 9. S&P 500 added 13. And that'll do it for us tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a wonderful weekend. Hope to see you back here again on Monday.